Good evening and welcome to this VET Team AMR Companion Animal Launch Event hosted by RCBS Knowledge. For any of you who are not aware, RCBS Knowledge is the charitable arm of RCBS, which aims to advance the quality of veterinary care for the benefits of animal, the public and society. My name is Sue Patterson. I'm currently the Junior Vice President of the Royal College. And although I don't do as much clinical work as I used to, I am a dermatologist. We know skin disease is a common presenting sign in primary care practice, and dermatology cases are an excellent example of where we can make a real difference with appropriate antimicrobial stewardship. It's therefore no surprise that amongst our speakers tonight, who I'll introduce properly a little bit later on, we're joined by two of my fellow veterinary dermatologists, Tim Nuttall and Annette Loeffler. Before we start properly, just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody, please. We would encourage you to ask questions as we go along. Please put those in the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. We'll try and take as many of them as we possibly can during the live session after our main speakers. But any that aren't answered during the, last, the live session, we will answer in the RCVS Knowledge Newsletter. And for those of you who weren't aware that we have a rather fabulous RCVS Knowledge Newsletter called In The Know, we will put a link in the chat box for you and we would love you to subscribe if you will. There will be a feedback form at the end of the meeting. And again, we'd be grateful if you could complete that for us. And as you probably noticed, we are recording the webinar. We have a lot of people registered tonight, but we recognize that not everybody may be able to join us. And so it will be available afterwards as a recording. For those who are social media savvy, we would absolutely love you to share your attendance using the hashtag, hashtag, Hashtag Vet Team AMR. So, as I've said, we have a packed program tonight, and we'll start in just a second with David Singleton, who I'm going to get him to unmute and share his screen. And I'll introduce each of our speakers briefly before they actually give their own presentation. So, our first speaker, I'm delighted to welcome David Singleton. David is going to introduce for us the Vet Team AMR. David qualified from the University of Liverpool in 2015, having discovered an interest in epidemiology and antimicrobial resistance during his training. This led to a PhD exploring the antimicrobial use and resistance surveillance in companion animals. He was awarded his PhD in 2019, again at the University of Liverpool. More recently, his interest has expanded to developing and assessing behavioural and vaccine interventions to hopefully slow the rate of antimicrobial resistance. So we're delighted that David can join us tonight. David, I'd like to hand you the stage. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Now, Vetim AMR has maybe many, many origins from many different people, but for me, I guess with my story, it started with something maybe not so very glamorous. It started with uh, acute diarrhea. So back in 2019, uh, I was fortunate to be involved with a paper which analysed many thousands of uh, electronic health records related to canine acute diarrhoea. And from that, although there are various limitations which I won't go into sort of detail now, we, we felt that it lended further weight to evidence to suggest that antimicrobials were not necessary in relation to canine acute diarrhoea. And actually, we were sort of quite confident looking back at the language used, we even said, hence, this study supports the view that antimicrobials are largely unnecessary for acute diarrhoea cases. It's been of particular importance when considering a global threat posed by AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So that was one of the feeling you know, quite, quite good about this paper. And, uh, and uh, actually, my fellow clinical lead, Vet, who has uh, uh, read the evidence and is becoming quite strong, I continue describing for Ken Akid. Diarrhea. The first few cases that they've tried, and I stopped and went, uh, okay, well, what, what actually have we got? What could we do to help support from, a, from a, I guess, an academic perspective, uh, people, in, people in practice who are wanting to make an improvement to the antimicrobial use? And... At the moment, we at that point in time, we had some papers, but they felt like there needed to be something a bit more uh, for, for those who are busy people in practice. So this led on to a, a randomized control trial, uh, again, working with Angie. We focused on above average prescribers of highest priority critically important antimicrobials. And we thought about what kind of interventions might work. And we created these packages of various levels, which focused on benchmarking, education, reflection, and supported change once practitioners have decided to make, make their change to uh, prescribing. The, the short story from this is that it was quite, quite successful, in fact, and uh, we, we were able to uh, reduce um, prescribing of these highest priority, critically important antimicrobials in cats, which are 
was maybe a little bit of a surprise to us, but really showed to us that uh, various tools can work and are and practitioners are receptive to these changes as well. But this was in a relatively small uh, selection of practices. So next question is, well, what do we do? Where to go from here? How do we share these tools with uh, with uh, with the profession and uh, really kind of take take things to the, the wider, more national level? And that really is where VET team AMR came in in collaboration with RCS Knowledge and then supported by the VMD. Now we took these sort of learnings from our previous uh, experience and thought, well, what what what, what elements might really work uh, when in combination to improve prescribing? We came up with these sort of three kind of uh, pillars or three sides of the triangle, which are benchmarking and audit, seeing how practitioners might be able to, um, you know, compare their prescribing against their peers, both in practice with other practices, other groups, and at a more national level. Practitioners might be able to reflect as well on their cases, compare cases, and, and really discuss, you know, what, what improvements can be made. And then finally, of course, uh, learning as well for those who feel like they would like to learn more about AMR and how they might optimize their prescribing. So today uh, we are going to be talking uh, about the learning platform. This is the sort of the first thing which is being released by RCS Knowledge for this project for companion animals. And for that, we've got uh, Dr. Tim Nussel from the University of Edinburgh, who's going to be talking in uh, more detail about the learning platform. And then in the pipeline as well, we've got these other elements of benchmarking, stroke audit and, and case reflection. And uh, Angie is going to give a little bit of a teaser to maybe what, what is to come in the future. Uh, in that regard. And we're hoping together that these tools might be really useful for uh, practitioners who are trying to make that change to try to aim towards more responsible use of antimicrobials. So it was just a really brief overview, kind of like a bit of a taster, if you like, of uh, what, what is to come, come with this project. And we really hope uh, that you'd like to get involved in this. And if you do want to know more, uh, the website is there to, um, to learn a little bit more. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'm going to hand, hand back to Sue now. Thank you, David. And I think that really has set the scene and we know how incredibly important this is as a, as a topic and our responsibility as veterinary professionals. So let's move on to our second speaker. And our second speaker, I'm delighted to say, is Fergus Allerton. Fergus is going to talk about antimicrobial use in companion animal practices. And while he shares his screen, I'll just read out his CV for you. Uh, Fergus graduated from the University of Bristol in 2004 and completed a residency in internal medicine at the University of Liège in Belgium. He is a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Medicine and currently works at the Willows Referral Service. Fergus is actively involved in veterinary antimicrobial stewardship and contributed to the development of the Protect Me guidelines, which are recently, I think, going to be updated, as well as being one of the driving forces behind the really successful antibiotic amnesty last year. With Enovat, which is the European Network for Optimization of Veterinary Antimicrobial Treatment, he is working on recommendations for antibiotic use for surgical prophylaxis, He's also a member of the WSAVA Therapeutic Guidelines Group, so he's hugely qualified to share his knowledge with us tonight, and we're delighted you've been able to join us, Fergus. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, well, it's a pleasure to be here and to introduce some of the very important topics ab ab about which hopefully this new hub will help. So I, I thought I'd start by just saying, if we are going to look to improve antimicrobial use, we have to have a bit of an understanding of where we're starting from. So how do we actually measure what we're doing currently? And we don't always have access to the, the perfect numbers that we would really like. So how much antibiotics is going into exactly the number of animals that we have. So these numerators and denominators, unfortunately, aren't that accessible. So in co collaboration with the group Rumor um, Companion Animal um, and Equine, there are new targets and metrics that are being designed to try and simplify and give us something to work towards. So we know that we can record the total amount of antibiotics sold. So we can get that information, but that could vary year on year, especially given sort of the, the COVID boom in puppies and uh, the, the different number of animals 
actually out there, then antibiotic use could go up, not necessarily for a bad reason if there's a greater population. So we can try and incorporate that and we can try and work out the number of animals and their total mass, if you like. So are there more big ones or more little ones? But actually one of the metrics that is used quite commonly by the veterinary medicines directorate, especially when they're reporting these uh, annual figures that hopefully help us get um, an idea of um, uh, our current yardstick, is the defined daily dose per vet. And just to give you an idea of what that is, it reflects the average number of days that each patient, be it a dog or a cat, in the UK is receiving an antibiotic throughout the year. And so it does take into account the total weight of active ingredients um, of each antibiotic. And this is sold rather than used, but we have to assume that these are the same thing. And it incorporates various estimates of the total weight of that feline or canine population using average weight measures from various sources. And it also allows for the daily dose rate. So how much do we give of any particular antibiotic, because when we're trying to compare different antibiotics, we want them to be on a level playing field. So we would maybe say we would typically use 12 and a half milligrams per kilogram twice daily of amoxiclav, at least that's the label dose. And we might use a single injection of eight milligrams per kilogram for cefavicin, but that does potentially last for up to 14 days. So they're making allowances for that and incorporating that into those calculations so that they are a fairer reflection of what's going on. And this is the data that we have. And this was published in the VAS um, 2021 report. So that came out November last year and there'll be a new one November this year. And you can see that there is a trend, an encouraging trend of decrease since 2014. So um, we can be pleased to see that in both cats and dogs, those numbers have gone down. But there was an increase between 2020 and 2021. And this may have a pandemic component to it. And certainly, I would look at these figures and see, say, more can still be done, we have a potential to bring these numbers down, and hopefully use less antibiotics. And we can see where we're going from and we can measure and chart that improvement. But what type of antibiotics are we using? And this, we can get a little bit more granularity. And again, it's different according to different species, but the indigo part, part of the pie chart is amoxiclav, the most commonly used antimicrobial globally, certainly in the UK. And it, it it does account for over 50% in canine use. And we could look at ways to, to bring that down and hopefully reduce total use and proportionate use and select the right antimicrobial for each indication. And I've put this up partly because there are some target antimicrobials who we would really like to bring down even faster and um, David mentioned the benchmarking intervention that has successfully helped bring down highest priority critically important antimicrobial use in cats, but still 41% of that was cefavicin. And so there's hopefully, with through education, through greater awareness, we can improve these types of numbers. Because antimicrobial stewardship is the key to achieving better use of our antimicrobials. We want to make sure that we do use the right antibiotic for the right indication. I, we need to have good diagnostics. We need to use our cytology, our culture, our antimicrobial susceptibility testing to make sure that we are getting these selections correct. We want to use it at the right time. We want to use it with the right dose and via the right route, all while causing the minimum damage to the actual patient and to future patients. Because the overall aim is that in doing so, in only using antimicrobials when they are appropriate and necessary for the benefit of those patients, we will limit the impact on antimicrobial resistance and preserve those antibiotics, those antimicrobials for future use. And this is vitally important because working on the um, 
estimates of Lord Jim O'Neill from back in 2016, there is a potential that if antimicrobial resistance is not kept in better check, we could be looking at global mortality in the region of 10 million people per year due to antimicrobial resistance. And if we feel that that might be scaremongering numbers, we need only look at the Lancet article from um, the beginning of last year, which reported already 1.2 million people dying globally directly due to or attributable to antimicrobial resistance and a further three and a half, four million whose death was associated with antimicrobial resistance. So this is already a significant global problem and we need to be part of that solution. And we can look also, and David has done some fantastic work here, again, using the Animal Health Surveillance Network, SAVNET, to look at the percentages of consultations, first consultations these are, where antimicrobials were prescribed. And I put a few common indications. I'm gonna steer clear of the pruritus, given the company and the fact that we are already um, dermatology heavy. Um, but from a acute vomiting, from a gastrointestinal perspective, acute vomiting and acute diarrhea are real opportunities for us to bring down antimicrobial use. These are common presentations, things that we are seeing on a regular basis, but one could question whether they really require that level of antimicrobial use. And I would make a strong argument that hopefully we could get these percentage of consultations really down to low single figures. These really should be reserved for cases where we're suspicious of underlying sepsis. So severely ill animals, it should not be a common finding. Given the presentations that we're seeing, we should be able to find better solutions to manage these patients. And in doing so, we could make a big impact. And hopefully there are resources out there that can help us make those decisions with confidence because all vets recognize a pressure from owners to get the, a, a solution to their um, pets um, malaise and to try and help them. And we're all aiming to do that. And we hopefully can find ways to do that that don't require antibiotics. The Protect Me poster, this is the 2018 version, is in the process of um, a complete revision. And if anyone watching is interested and would like to be part of that revision, then please do send me an email. There are plenty of opportunities. And I feel that a collaborative approach, recognizing the voices of all different stakeholders will make it an even more useful and accessed resource. And I think that we can always reflect on the way that we're using antibiotics and check whether it reflects current evidence and look and see if we could avoid them if they're not necessary. The Protect Me does come as a poster. There are a variety of other resources available. And I would just highlight one, and this is from Ontario Vet College. Um, you can download it on the First Line app platform. It was actually produced by um, the next speaker, Scott Weiss um, and team. And I think that this is an, another aid that ha handily will sit in your pocket and can just help you check what antibiotic you should use if you even need to use one and even yet you can see there some um, duration um, information so if we can get these things right we can improve it we can bring those um, numbers down and what I would say is that whichever guideline resource you reach for um, inevitably they say the same thing and you become something of an echo chamber saying, well, we don't think antimicrobials are indicated for acute diarrhea, for clean surgical procedures, for FLUTD, for subclinical bacteria. And I think that there is a growing consensus that we can manage all of these conditions without antimicrobials in the vast majority of cases. And I think that if we can all echo that message, if we can all reinforce it, hopefully we can help achieve um, improved antimicrobial use. And an extra tool that was produced by BSAVA and SAMSOC um, back in 2018 is the non-prescription form. These are still available. And we know from human studies that they make a difference. 
They help bring down antimicrobial use and importantly, with no negative impact on patient outcome. So consider these, if you're facing a challenging consultation and the owner maybe isn't as on board as you would like them to be, then consider whether the use of a non-prescription form could help communicate that message, could inform your client of the importance of antimicrobial resistance, of alternative treatments that will hopefully manage this pet just as effectively and can negate the need for antimicrobial use. And just at the bottom of the form, there is some safety netting advice, just to make sure that if the patient doesn't do as well as you expect, or if it deteriorates at any point, that the owner is advised to get back in contact and you can review that decision. So maybe if there is something more serious going on and we feel it is bacteria in origin, we can reach for antimicrobials in those situations. And I think that guidelines are part of enablement stewardship. They are a way for people to convey recommendations and say, hopefully, if you adhere to these, if we all demonstrate prudent and rational use of antimicrobials, we will achieve the, the aim, i.e. to make those pets better without or while minimizing the impact on the wider environment and potentiation of antimicrobial resistance. So I think guidelines, if we demonstrate that we're doing things well, that would be an amazing step forward. In other European countries, they are taking a slightly different tack on this, and they have introduced slightly more stringent legislation that limits the prescriber autonomy and stops people reaching from the antimicrobial that they feel is indicated in any particular situation. And in France and Germany, for example, you now need to have submitted an antimicrobial susceptibility test before you can prescribe any fluoroquinolones or any third generation cephalosporins. So it's part of that treatment pathway. Now, we've yet to see whether this is how this is going to impact on antimicrobial use, whether it is going to change patterns of prescribing. But I think if we are not careful and if we don't demonstrate that with guidelines and we can with pets taking an active role in antimicrobial stewardship if others who would take the sort of the the rod approach find that they achieve better numbers better overall results in terms of antimicrobial use there will be greater pressure for a legislation to come in and restrict the way that we work in veterinary medicine. So I would encourage people to think carefully about it. And there are options to, to introduce some self-imposed restrictive behaviors. So for example, you could say, um, we're going to try and use culture where possible. And I'd encourage people to do that. It's some of these tools, especially in-house cytology can be really useful to guide decision-making. And maybe, especially when you're reaching for a highest priority critically important antimicrobial, run it by a colleague. Ask, would you use an antibiotic in this situation? And would you particularly use this antibiotic in this situation? And if you get a thumbs down, think again. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching and for listening to that. I'll pass back to Sue and look forward to catching up with everyone later on. Thank you, Fergus. As always, that was fantastic. And please, everybody, do check out the chat. Jen from RCVS Knowledge has put lots of links in there for you. There's links through to the AMR Hub, which, if you've not had a look at, is a really excellent resource. So I'm now going to introduce our next speaker. Um, and I'm delighted that we have Scott Wees joining us, who's going to talk about antimicrobial resistance in companion animals. And again, while Scott is sharing his screen, I'll just run through his, it's a very abbreviated CV, but Scott is an, a veterinary internist and microbiologist, and he's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He is currently a professor at the Ontario Veterinary College, which is from the University of Guelph, and he's also a zoonotic disease public health microbiologist at the University of Guelph's Centre for Public Health and Zoonoses. He's also Chief of Infection Control at the Ontario Veterinary College Teaching Hospital and holds a Canada Research Chair in Zoonotic Disease. His current areas of interest include bacterial infections in animals and humans, methicillin resistant staphylococcal infections, clostridium difficile, antimicrobial resistance, 
emerging infectious disease and infection control. And we're delighted, Scott, you've been able to join us tonight to share your presentation with us. I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks a lot, Sue. And thanks for having me for this uh, really nice initiative. So I wasn't really sure what to talk about for this topic, to be honest. So AMR and companion animals, um, you know, I could talk about bacteria, I could talk about prevalence, incidence, details like that, but I really want to want to focus on is the why. Like, why do we care? One of the biggest barriers we have to controlling resistance and implementing the things that Fergus talked about was, you know, the initiative to do it, the wanting to do it and getting our clients to accept it and want to do it. So I'm not going to go over a lot of bacteria, but we know about resistance and we know the impact it can have. We don't know exactly what the impact is, but we know there's an impact, whether that's that patient we're seeing or at the population level. Start off really probably for us with staphylococci, methicillin resistant staph. The next wave was these multi-drug resistant gram negatives that are probably going to be a bigger problem for us over time. We've always known about Pseudomonas and its resistance. We've got what we call the heck yes bugs, these inducibly resistant gram negatives. And there will be more. And there are more besides this. So we're confronted with a wide array of bacteria that can become resistant and can cause problems. So why do we care? And that may seem like kind of a dumb question for the audience that's here because you obviously have some care about it. But there's a whole range of reasons why we should care. And if someone can't be motivated by one, hopefully we can find something in this list that will motivate them. That could be animal health. We certainly have impacts in animal health, associated impacts in animal welfare, human-animal bond, uh, owner costs, vet you know, owner relationships, which can take a hit with these, veterinarian stress, public health, and as Fergus mentioned, scrutiny of our antibiotic use and the risks that come to us if we have excessive restrictions that, that compromise our ability to take care of patients. Because we can get into these scenarios. Well, I can treat your pet's infection, but it'll be more expensive. Okay, that's a common one. Or it'll be more complicated. Or, you know, this drug I need to use, it's a hassle to use. It's injectable or it has greater risks for your pet. Or, you know, it's a drug we really want to use in people and not animals. And then we get the one that we don't really have to deal with much in most places, but it is on the horizon. I can't treat your pet's infection because there are no options. I haven't seen this yet. We've always found an option. They haven't been very good sometimes, but you know this is on the horizon where I can't treat your pet's infection because I'm not allowed to use the drug that I need. And us being better stewards of antibiotics prevents this last one from two areas. One, we have less resistance, and two, we have less restriction on what we can do. So why do we have a problem with resistance companion animals? We need to know why the problem is there if we want to address it. And it's complex. Antimicrobial resistance is called a wicked problem. The, the problem itself is really kind of hard to define. The steps to solve it are hard to define. We don't really know what the end game is, the end points are. And you can't just come up with do this and things will get better. Ultimately though, we know, you know the driver is antibiotic use. And that could be in dogs and cats, that could be in livestock, it's in the environment, it's in people. Everywhere we put an antibiotic or everywhere that antibiotic goes, meaning the environment, we create some pressure for resistance and that can have a clinical impact down the road. Now we don't know the role of all these. So how much AMR in companion animals is driven by antibiotic use in companion animals versus antibiotic use in food animals. And, and the main thing there probably is raw diets uh, and antibiotic use in humans. And all of these do play a role in resistance in our companion animal population, but we don't know how much. And understanding the relative contribution of those is really important because that helps us focus our mitigation measures. If 99% of this is from use in companion animals, we focus just on us. If some of it's diet driven, we can look at that. If a lot of it's coming from humans, well, there's not as much we can do about that except be aware and try to contain what we can contain. Because we know antibiotic resistance is a complex issue. This is sometimes called a confusogram. And it's actually overly simplistic. I'm working on another version of this right now. It's a bit of a disaster. Because we look at companion animals, one little blurb down here. Humans, one little blurb here. But we know antibiotics go into a lot of areas. And we can't address this by saying, OK, well, if we stop treating cattle with antibiotics or treat them better, we're going to fix the problem. Because we're not. I'm going to make it better. But we're not going to fix it by addressing one of these areas. So that was kind of the macro level, but I'm gonna bring it down to the micro level or the patient level again to show some of these issues. So this is Meg. Meg is a middle-aged Labrador retriever, like a lot of middle-aged labs, she's a bit on the fat side. And like a lot of middle-aged labs, she ruptured her cruciate. 
So she had a surgical procedure, as most of you would know, a TPLO, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. Pretty major procedure, uh, one that we do associate with a higher than normal risk of surgical site infection. And they're mainly staph, and more and more of these are MRSP, methicillin resistant staph pseudomedius. And that's what Meg, ha Meg got. And you can see from this, if you can read the little R's there, it's resistant to everything on this primary panel. There are a couple options amicacin and chloramphenicol. Um, so, not great options, not many options, but we do have, have an option for her. Because, you know, we look at this patient, we look at this infection, and that's when we have our holy crap moment is, okay, I've got this dog, it's got a deep infection, I need an antibiotic if I want to try to save this leg, probably. And how am I going to do this, treating this dog effectively without causing all these downstream problems that we think about? But then we think about it more broadly. Okay, Meg doesn't live in isolation. Meg comes to our hospital. It's obviously not her, but I'm in charge of infection control in our hospital. I don't want her spreading this around to other patients or to staff. Meg lives with the family. She's got a high-risk infant in the household she has close contact with. This isn't Meg here, but she has this job. She goes into human hospitals and does acute care hospital visitation. So she goes into the environments of high-risk people where we know things move back and forth, including methicillin-resistant staff. Like a lot of the dogs, she goes to the dog park. You know, what goes in comes out when it comes to antibiotics. They pee out antibiotics. She's passing antibiotic-resistant bacteria and feces, nasal secretions, close contact with other individuals. So we're moving this beyond a dog with an infection to an ecosystem problem. And then we've got the, the human dynamic. We may have an owner that's, that's upset. We may have an owner that's stressed. We may have an owner that's got financial concerns because now they can barely afford the surgery. Now we're looking at a thousand pounds in post-op care for this infection. And they, the owner may have all of these. And these come down on us because we deal with the repercussions of you know, our owners being unhappy or stressed or having cost constraints. So it isn't just a, well, she's got an infection, so we just need to find the right drug for this infection. We've got this ecosystem and we've got this human factor that's quite significant. And then thinking about it more broadly, okay, I wanna treat Meg, but I also wanna treat you know, the Meg that I see tomorrow and the one that I see next month and next year and 10 years from now, because what I do to her today may influence what I can do down the road. If I use all my antibiotics today on her, am I gonna be able to treat the Meg of 10 years? And we can make an analogy here, maybe somewhat, that antimicrobial prescriptions are like checks. And right now we're writing checks that we can't cash, or at least the future won't be able to cash. Or maybe put it another way, we're spending our bank account and leaving nothing in there for the kids. Because if we use all the antimicrobials, we say, okay, well, we can get by with it right now. We're setting future generations up for problems, uh, just like we're doing with climate change and other things. And I think as clinicians, it's easy to get focused on the patient, right? I've got this dog, it's just one dog. I know maybe I don't need to do this with her because maybe she doesn't have a bacterial infection, but it's just one dog, right? That's okay. And too often we forget that, you know, if we just do it to one dog, but a million people do that, we do this to just this one dog, but we just do it to that one dog like every week, we're having a big impact. So we do a lot of things that we think may not have a big impact, but cumulatively they do. And a lot of things that are really based on our fear. And this gets more into the stewardship side than the resistance side. But I think we know to a large degree, the antibiotics, you know, the most psychoactive drugs we have, Brad Spellberg has said, but they act on us. They make us feel better because I'm doing something, right? We want to do something. We're conditioned to do something, even though doing something might not be what we want to do. Now, I've been talking about AMR as the problem, right? But I'll, I'll argue here, maybe somewhat strangely, that AMR actually isn't the problem. AMR is the end result. It's certainly a problem, but it's not what we need to think about because we can't directly fix AMR. We indirectly fix AMR, and we fix that by antimicrobial use. And antimicrobial use itself isn't really the problem either because we use antimicrobials because of a reason, right? Because of animal health, because of animal management, because of veterinary care, because of human behavior. Something drives antibiotic use and that drives antibiotic resistance. So we focus on AMR as the problem, but we need to focus on the real problem, which is use and the real root of that problem, which is animal health and animal care. And only by addressing these bottom areas can we improve the end result which is AMR. So just to wrap up here, another kind of big picture thing. We, I mentioned before, this is a wicked problem, right? It's a very complex area. We don't have one single silver bullet. We're not gonna say do this and we will fix AMR in veterinary medicine or in companion animals. 
it's going to require a multidisciplinary approach, a multi-sector approach across the One Health spectrum. Veterinary medicine can't do it itself. Everyone has to participate. And that sometimes leads to arguments, well, you know, the human the physicians are throwing antibiotics to their patients like candy, so what can we do when they're misusing antibiotics? Or someone could say, well, they're using antibiotics by a lot more in livestock, so what does it matter about companion animals? But every person that has an input of an antimicrobial into this ecosystem plays a role. And while the individual prescriber can't fix a multidisciplinary problem by themselves and can't act in every sector, they can do what they can do. I can impact what I do. I can't impact what a physician does. But every intervention starts with an individual prescriber. And if we don't get the individual prescribers as the base, we don't get any of this multidisciplinary, multi-sector benefit that we need to control this problem. So it was a bit soapboxy at the end, so I apologize for that. But there's my, my contact information if anyone wants to get a hold of me. Uh, and with that, I think I will pass it back to you, Sue. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Scott. That, that was really, really thought provoking. So please, guys, if you want to put questions into the Q&A box, please feel free to do so. Don't leave it till the end because we'll inevitably get a little bit of a rush. We're really happy to you to put questions in as we go along. And I'm hoping that Scott will be able to stay with us and take some questions because he certainly prodded the, th the hornet's nest, I think, with that with that presentation. So thank you, Scott. That was really, really good. Um, I'm going to move on to our next presentation, and I'm delighted that we have Tim Nuttall joining us. And Tim's going to give us a little bit of a tour of the companion animal learning platforms. We're delighted that Tim is able to join us. Uh, Tim is one of the dermatologists on our panel tonight. So Tim is an RCVS specialist in veterinary dermatology, and he's head of dermatology at the University of Edinburgh Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies. He runs a busy referral clinic with he has particular interest in atopic dermatitis, otitis, laser surgery, but as far as we're concerned tonight, antimicrobial stewardship and infection control, I know he's really passionate about. He has written over 100 clinical and scientific publications and has presented globally uh, over 180 lectures. So he's also served on far too many scientific and clinical committees for me to be able to list here today. And he has received the BSAVA's very prestigious Woodrow Award for outstanding contributions to veterinary medicine. So uh, it's some excellent and really thought provoking uh, talk so far. I first got involved with AMR way back in 2004 when I happened to be on BSAVA scientific committee. And the lesson learned is never not go to a meeting because you'll be wound up with the most difficult job and it was the time when MRSA um, exploded onto the scene in animals uh, and I was tasked with leading the response to this and I got really interested in it and in those early days um, there were very few of us working in AMR in the vet field and uh, it sometimes felt that we were just lone voices in the wilderness and it's been great to see how many more uh, talented and gifted and hardworking people have become have come on board over the last few years and how we've really gained mainstream traction here to improve things um, because this this isn't a new uh, phenomenon um, you know this was 1945 now my mother was born uh, just before the second world war now if you meet a don't tell her I told you that she's very sensitive about it but she very nearly died as a toddler uh, from what would now be classed as uh, an antibiotic treatable respiratory infection uh, and then my father who sadly passed away uh, 2019 but prior to that he uh, had some health issues and he contracted an MRSA urinary tract infection it was quite severe fortunately there were intravenous antibiotics that were still effective and could save his life so within the lifetime of my parents we are, we have gone from a pre-antibiotic era to staring over the edge into the post-antibiotic abyss and that's not a great um thing to have achieved uh, as a human race and as professionals both in the medical and veterinary field and there is no point uh, having a blame culture about this I think we all have to acknowledge as clinicians as patients as animal owners we've all behaved badly and we need to get better and this is where the vet team AMR 
education platforms come in and what I'm going to do over about the next 10 minutes is just give you a really quick run through um, about how to uh, engage with this and navigate your way through the resources that are available and I would like to acknowledge the incredible work that the RCVS knowledge team have put into this it's been uh, an amazing achievement uh, over the last couple of years to get this and the farm animal vet champions up and running and again acknowledge the the the, the work that all the contributors have put into this um, nobody's been paid this is a, a charitable exercise and just to see the passion um, that that uh, people have brought to this has has been wonderful so that's where you'd navigate to and then create an account and log in to get your best uh, uh, to get access to everything and the best experience and then from uh, the landing page there you need to click on vet team AMR and this will take you to the introductory page and then there's a few things here that I'll just point out so the whole site is very intuitive very very straightforward to use um, and it's full of hyperlinks to go almost anywhere. So if you click on these boxes at the top here, we're, at the moment we're in the VET team AMR, but that'll take you around the whole of the RCVS knowledge site, which is vast and an incredible learning resource. And you can search all their initiatives and courses there. Now there's also a link to the AMR hub, so we're just going to take a sideways step for a second to have a quick look at that. And if you've not been there already, I would strongly recommend having a look at the the hub there, because again, this is a a, um, a way of signposting. So you can go there, you can pick up the vet team AMR stuff, the vet farm vet champions. Um, it'll also talk about the amnest the antibiotic amnesty campaign that Fergus. Um, introduced, introduced and ran out last year. Uh, there's lots of news items, links to reports and so on. So incredibly useful one-stop shop to find things or to be signposted to where they are. So we'll go back to the Vet Team AMR page and if you look at the links at the bottom there we've got the Farm Vet Champions um, link but for tonight we're launching the companion uh, animal equine was launched a couple of weeks ago so if you click on those links it takes takes you to the welcome page or the landing page now I acted as the clinical lead for the companion uh, animal uh, initiative and Tim Mayer uh, acted as the equine clinical lead so it's the kind of the two Tim show here so if you if you're interested you can click on the um, the, the link there and listen to a little interview uh, and podcast that we've put together to introduce the, the the whole initiative. But if you scroll down from that page then it uh, brings you to um, the important stuff which is all the modules that are available. Now these are the ones that are available at the moment. This is a dynamic program. We're not going to sit on this uh, forevermore. These will be updated as we get new information and we'll be adding to these um, as we source uh, new materials as, as well. Now if you click on the four more information boxes that opens up the pages and that gives you a really quick way to just have a quick look at what each module contains, how long uh, it should take you to complete the entire module, who's teaching it and what the different learning outcomes are. And we realize that not all of these modules are going to be relevant to everybody depending on the type of practice that you're doing or your role within the, within the practice and there's material here that is relevant to vets. Uh, of all shapes and sizes um, the, that are relevant to nurses, that are relevant to animal care technicians, that are relevant to even the front of house reception staff as well. So it gives you a very quick uh, overview of the, uh, to allow you to select the things that are relevant. But then if we go back, so let's have a now a look at this first module. So this is the introduction to antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance. And once you click on these, then it will open up and bring you into the module. So this is the top of the page and it gives you a quick introduction um, with some instructions about how to go through the material, uh, what sort of materials there are for each of the topics within the module, uh, and then explaining about the uh, end of topic quizzes.
and then if you scroll down from that page, uh, the, from the top of that page, it'll bring you to the links to open up each of these topics. So for um, this introductory module, we have an introduction to antimicrobial resistance. Um, we have a One Health perspective. We have a, a, a strategic landscape perspective about the importance and impact of AMR uh, across uh, companion animal sectors and the veterinary profession more generally. There's a quick introduction to how this fits into the RCVS practice standards scheme. And then we've got um, some other uh, links as well. And we'll have a look at some of these. Uh, as we go through. So if you click on the introduction to antimicrobial resistance, this opens up the page. The others are all going to be very similar to this. Um, and what you get there is a link so you can click on the webinar that I put together about introducing antimicrobials, how resistance arises uh, and how we can prevent that through better stewardship. And it should take you about 33 minutes to go through that. Um, you can also click on the, the references uh, and some notes and other materials that go alongside that. And then at the bottom there, we've got this podcast by the Chief Veterinary Officer, Christine Middlemas, and invited guests that had a roundtable discussion about the importance of AMR um, and the importance of improving stewardship in the vet profession. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we've got the end of topic quiz. Um, and this is a way uh, of uh, auditing um, your engagement with it, but it's also a way for yourself to work out um, how much you've taken on board, um, what you might want to go back and have a look at again and so on. So anybody that wants uh, a quick um, bit of insider knowledge on here, the answer to that one is the third option uh, because the mycoplasmas lack a cell wall. Don't tell everybody though. Now the other uh, useful thing, and I said earlier that th this whole site is very well connected with lots of, of ways to navigate very, very easily. So if you go down here, you can go back a step, you can go forward a step, or you can jump to any of the topics uh, within this module quite easily without having to, you know, to trek back to the landing page uh, and go back forward again. Now I said there are some other links here, so the the other topics there would be very similar in, in their layout. There is an, uh, an, a, an area to give feedback. We love feedback. We want to know how you uh, you found uh, the, the site and the modules, the topics, the educational materials. What could we do better? What could we provide you? Is there some, are there unmet needs? Um, uh, you know, so just feel free to let us know on that. And then the other important thing is that we've made all this material available in a variety of formats because we recognize uh, that there are disabilities, there are uh, diverse people out there. We also recognize people learn in different ways, but that also people might want to download things so that they can be listening to a podcast while they're out on uh, a visit or traveling or something like that. So we've done our level best to, to provide the same material in a variety of different formats suited to different people, different learning um, preferences. Um, but also enabling to, to fit lifestyle as, as well. And again, if there are formats that you would like uh, to see that we haven't provided, just please let us know uh, and we can look at that to see if it's feasible. Now, when you've completed uh, these modules, you get a certificate. Everybody loves a certificate. Um, and so those will be awarded and downloaded on completion and completion of the um, the end of course, uh, uh, end of module quizzes. Uh, and then we've also put together the, these course badges. And that's a little bit of fun. Everybody likes to have a reward for a, achieving something. But we're also hoping that by the use of these certificates and course badges, we um, can begin to highlight uh, practices and individuals that have engaged with the, um, the learning platform. Um, and just try and disseminate that awareness uh, out um, amongst other veterinary professionals, um, but also the wider public. And so just to finish up, this is just a quick overview uh, and outline. So 
It, the Farm Vet Champions course were, has um, has been up and running for a couple of years or so now and has proved to be very successful and is just one of the ways that we've achieved a very substantial reduction uh, both in total antimicrobial use in production animals but also mo importantly a very substantial decrease in the critically important antimicrobial. So dropped uh, use overall and seen this shift towards the, the first line drugs. And this is what we want to try and achieve in companion animal practice and, uh, and equine practice. So as Sue said, I'm one of the, the dermatology mafia uh, on this evening. And if you remember, Fergus showed that slide showing that in, in that study, 50% of the pruritus um, note it's pruritus and not pruritus, but that's just me being a pedant. Uh, consultations resulted in antimicrobial use. Now, itchy dogs is my day job. Uh, we use nothing like that. So this is a, another, another example of an area where we can target reduction. And I won't talk much about the antimicrobial audit tool because uh, Angie's going to give you a, a teaser on, on that a little bit later on. But by using these educational platforms, what we're hoping to achieve is a network of people who become champions within their practice and their practice group for antimicrobial stewardship because we need to do better if we're going to preserve uh, the efficacy of these drugs for the future. And as Scott and Fergus pointed out, you know, this would be critical for the continue or critical for continuing what we've regarded as modern veterinary practice uh, into the future and you know if you want to find out what pre-antibiotic veterinary practice was have a read of the James Herriot books if you do that it, it, it's a sobering uh, read there um, and then we're hoping that these champions can become ambassadors for change and then lead out uh, best practice uh, with, within their own teams. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And you very generously acknowledged all the fantastic work that's being done by the team at RCVS Knowledge. But I think we also have to acknowledge the enormous amount of time and effort that you've put into driving this as well. So I'm sure everybody is very appreciative of that. And um, I wasn't going to mention the misspelling of paritis, but seeing as how you did then, well, it's now. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll hold my hand. I can't resist. <laughs> it's, now, it's, now in the, it's now in the public domain, but we'll move swiftly on. Thank you, Tim. That was a great presentation. Really, really useful. So we're going to have two clinical presentations now, and I'm delighted to say the first of those, um, we saw before the use of antibi antibiotics, antimicrobials in managing paritic dogs. So um, Annette Loffler is going to join us and talk about antimicrobial stewardship in those particular cases. So I'll let her put her screen up and I'll introduce her to you. So Annette graduated from Munich Veterinary School in Germany in 1994 and subsequently worked in mixed practice in Cumbria. She completed a residency in veterinary dermatology and a PhD on MRSA in companion animals at the Royal Veterinary College. She is currently professor in veterinary dermatology and cutaneous bacteriology at the RVC, and she divides her time between dermatology referral clinics at the RVC, teaching and her research. She has an active role in the referral hospital infection control and antimicrobial guideline activities, and she's one of the co-authors of the recent WABD clinical consensus guidelines on methicillin resistant staphylococci in small animal practice. And as if that didn't keep her busy enough, she's currently the Editor-in-Chief of Veterinary Dermatology. So we're delighted and that you've been able to join us today. Um, I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And um, thanks for the kind introduction, reminding me of graduating from Munich. That was so many years ago. And I have to say, I hadn't even heard of dermatology as a separate discipline at the time. So thank you also vet team AMR for carving out some time here for skin disease, um, because that's obviously very close to my heart. And the, but the question is why this title or why this topic um, about antimicrobial stewardship in itchy animals? Because as we all know, there is nothing known anti-itch in antimicrobials, but you've seen this study already. Um, the first study is from Liverpool here on consultations for dogs with pruritus out of, that's from their electronic um, patient record system 
out, out of 62,000 consultations, antimicrobials were actually prescribed for 51% and 25% of those were systemic, which again, I can't remember the, the sort of a, a, a case this week where I prescribed systemic antimicrobials and clinical practice is my day job. So um, the, this is clearly surprising and very valuable baseline data. And then this is the, the bottom study on prescribing practices in dogs diagnosed with pyoderma, 92% of those received systemic antimicrobial therapy. And this is really, as the politicians would say, there is a lot of room for improvement. But obviously we all know that in animals, pyoderma can be itchy in its own right. And then pyoderma is very often due to a primary itchy disease. So it's not totally um, out of context here that antimicrobials have got their role to play. But um, this is not just a clinical presentation, but I also wanted to make it a bit um, sort of console room focused and also positive because there are huge opportunities for animals with skin disease to actually reduce or replace antimicrobials in a day-to-day -day clinic. And I'll just say a few words on the opportunities with regard to diagnostics so that we can confirm it's bacterial very quickly and actually diagnose the underlying primary disease that led to um, ioderma or bacterial infection, skin infection very easily in the clinic and therefore prevent recurrences that often lead to repeated prescribing. So these are opportunities one and two. And then opportunity three refers to the, the advantage we have with animals with skin disease that we've actually got the diseased organ right under our hands. So we can use topical antibacterial therapy. And there is quite a lot of evidence that has emerged over the past 10 years with regard to efficacy of antimicrobial topical use on its own um, and possibly in the future on reducing the need for a systemic therapy if it's used in combination. And then opportunity four will refer to which bug and which drug because we do actually know quite a lot about that in, in dogs with pyoderma and opportunity five on what can we do to actually shorten the duration here. So this is the, the main positive spin to my, my 10 minutes here. And obviously awareness, communication and guideline play a big role with the management of animals with skin disease because they're often chronic, ongoing, lifelong diseases where we expect the owners to do a lot of hard work at home. So owners need to trust our plan and that usually requires quite a bit of communication in the consult room. And we need to be aware that antimicrobials are actually worth this time and this communication with owners, even if it's not everybody's cup of tea. Good, so just briefly, if there is one tool that can support um, responsible use of antimicrobials, is it's cytology, in-house cytology. It's so quick, it's so cheap, and it's extremely valuable. It can literally be done in five minutes with, and that's not possible with any other organ here. It obviously applies to wound infections and all the surface infections where we can just take a quick sample. All we need is a diff quick, some sellotape or some swabs and some slides, and we do need a good microscope. But then we can actually see the enemy. Within five minutes, we can show these cocci here to an owner or just see them for ourselves. And that's what I always say to the students, that is then responsible use of antimicrobials because we've actually shown this is this bacterial. We can't do that as quickly in, with other organs where we have to send samples off to the lab. But for example, if we see lots of malassezia in something like this skin fold here, then the dog needs antifungal medication rather than antibacterial medication. So this is a great opportunity. And cytology is something that we should all really promote and do every day. It's the number one underestimated, underused tool in clinical small animal practice. Then opportunity two here refers to why do dogs get pyoderma? Because pyoderma is actually always secondary, at least in my books. So we always need to find out what is the, what, why did this dog get pyoderma? Because the better we understand the disease, the better we can actually address it. And for example, in the pig industry, um, antimicrobial reduction has, has been achieved by understanding a lot more about the diseases recently that 
lead to antimicrobial use. So for pyoderma, unfortunately, actually, we don't know that much, but there are two good studies that showed that allergic skin disease is the big player and obviously associ associated with it, with itch. Ectoparasites and endocrinopathies and other things, so any disruption of the skin barrier function will lead to commensals to overgrow. They just use the opportunity and have a party if there is anything disturbing the skin's ability to defend itself or keep the balance. But um, allergic skin disease is here the big one. And allergic skin disease is also something that has or is often leading to repeated courses of antibiotics because nobody can cure allergy. So allergy is in the dog is a disease for life. And therefore, if the dog's got allergy for life, the pyoderma is going to recur. And that's a great opportunity for us to actually do better. And there are already guidelines out and they get updated very frequently on the treatment, for example, of canine atopic dermatitis. So this is something where we can actually reduce antimicrobial um, prescribing quite dramatically, I think, because we can actually address the underlying allergies. So even though it sounds totally counterproductive, in many cases, I actually end up treating the, the dog with glucocorticoids rather than with antimicrobials, which I might have done 20 years ago. But obviously the underlying allergies need to be diagnosed accurately as well. So the way to do that, and this is where my onion comes in here, is to resolve the pyoderma first and then reassess, see what clinical signs you're left with. And if they are compatible with underlying allergies of pruritus and erythema, then we can work along the way of managing the allergy. But even though allergy is a common underlying cause, there's not always, not every pyoderma is allergic. So here are three animals that have received far too many antimicrobials for their skin disease. The dog on the left, for example, has got a widespread deep pyoderma due to demodicosis. So that needed acaricide, not antimicrobial. The dog in the middle is walking on haired skin and therefore has got these nodules coming out at the surface. And again, there might be a, an aspect of secondary microbial infection that might get a little bit better on antibiotics, but antibiotics are not the cure here. And this short haired breed on the right has been lying on a hard bed and therefore getting those friction deep pyodermas here. And it basically just needs a soft mattress. So there are lots of underlying causes that can be addressed, which either, resol which either make the pyoderma resolve on its own or at least speed up cure. And then there is Roly here, our young Roly, where even after 24 visits to our hospital and over five years, we never worked out what the underlying cause was. So it's sometimes easier said than done, although there aren't that many dogs where we really start to grow gray hair. But for those, um, opportunity three is really a big player here and that's topical antibacterial therapy. And my residency project was about antibacterial therapy for the use of superficial pyoderma on its own. And it does work, I can say that for sure, but there is also lots of evidence now published on the efficacy of topical antibacterial therapy on its own or in combination. And either to prevent recurrences of these long-term allergic patients or to resolve superficial pyoderma on its own. The good news is you can actually save the owner hundred pounds for a culture if you're going for topical treatment because culture is not relevant if you're going to use antibiotics, antimicrobials topically. There are no breakpoints that the labs can use, so they might send you a report, but it doesn't actually reflect what um, you want to, the, the mode of application that you're going to use. And there are lots of different products available now to suit the owner because compliance is obviously the key thing for the products to work. You don't need to get all owners into the bath with their dogs, but that does require a little bit of consultation time as well to work out, is this a suitable owner dog combination and which product might actually suit them in order to um, ensure a good outcome for the patient. And sometimes things go wrong and then you might think, oh, I should have used systemic antibiotics for this pyoderma here. Um, why did I just go for topicals? And Fergus has already shown you the 
the non-prescribing form. I just wanted to show you this for Cava, the, the European Vet Society poster here. It's actually quite an old resource from 2013, but it's incredibly useful, I think, because it's, it's sort of a, com a, a group of experienced vets who put their, put their um, wisdom together and put their neck out here by saying these are actually indications where systemic antimicrobial use is considered unnecessary. So again, it's anecdote rather than evidence in many cases, but at least it gives you some backup here to choose the topical route alone rather than systemics. And you can see here those uh, um, skin infections are included. And pictures are sometimes better than a thousand words. So here we've got little Mel, which sort of made the nicest pictures in my mind with a superficial pyoderma widespread looking quite dramatic in this bulldog puppy here before treatment with just um, a chlorhexidine myconazole shampoo every other day, three, three weeks later and three months later, totally haired. So this is something that's certainly suitable for long-term use. There are occasionally concerns raised about resistance or tolerance towards topical use, but remember we're not using those on healthy skin, we're using them for a reason in order to replace systemic antimicrobials. But then inevitably, we all, you've probably all got examples, there are some dogs that do need systemic therapy, whether that's for deep pyoderma or some um, owner-dog combinations where topical use isn't suitable. And this is where opportunity four comes in because we actually do know the bug very well involved in skin infections. Staphylococci or Staphylococcus pseudonymidias by job description live on the skin, colonize the skin. Um, but if anything changes in the host um, ability to defend itself, then we get pyoderma. So they are considered the major canine skin pathogen. And what we also know, and there are good um, screening studies published is that Staphylococcus pseudendermidis is a very conservative pathogen and it tends to be susceptible to clindamycin, TMPS, so the sulfonamides, and the beta lactams. So I've put clindamycin and TMPS here in bold because I think we are not using them frequently enough at the moment, but the beta lactams will also work. And there isn't really much alternative in the Staphylococcus pseudendermidis world because either they come in a very susceptible version or they come as MRSP, methicillin resistant staph pseudendermidias, which is highly multidrug resistant. And for those MRSPs, they're usually resistant to fluoroquinolones and to sofovacin, and therefore there's no point in even giving or prescribing a broad spectrum fluoroquinolone just in case. So if an owner stands in front of you and says, can you not just prescribe a stronger antibiotic? Then MRSP is definitely not the scenario to consider any of that. So they're either very susceptible where we can use those first line or first tier antimicrobials effectively, or they don't respond to anything and we have to go offline, uh, off license. And those off license antibiotics do come with a lot of baggage. But for those things, we've got guidelines and there will be new guidelines coming out, hopefully at the end of the year with new tables. And those guidelines will also recommend to do culture and susceptibility testing frequently. So that, that's obviously a cost consideration for the owner. And what the guidelines will also say, or, or include a bit more information about is how long to treat pyoderma for. And for superficial pyoderma, the recommendations will go down to two weeks, it used to be three weeks. And for deep pyoderma, they'll go down to three weeks with the longer courses to be replaced by closer monitoring. So more frequent revisits where we can then extend um, longer courses if needed. But basically the trend we're following the human medicine recommendations to aim for shorter durations, monitor more closely and hopefully shorten the duration due the, due, um, by the addition of topical therapy for both superficial pyoderma and deep pyoderma. Good, so just in summary, more cytology, more topical treatment, treat the underlying causes, and for systemic, if systemic therapy is needed, then more targeted approaches. And in my 
books, no animal should have antimicrobial treatment for skin disease unless they're on good flea control. Glucocorticoids have got a role to play in replacing antimicrobials. And we can do a lot by booking those animals in for more revisits, seeing them at the end of the antimicrobial therapy and thereby hopefully shortening the duration of systemic therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as always, a wonderful practical presentation and some real opportunities there to reduce our use of, of antimicrobials, which is which is great. Thank you very much. And uh, she will Annette will be around for some questions. I can see some more questions coming into the Q&A. Please feel free to stick those in there as we go along. We're going to take those after our next presentation and we're going to switch subject now. And we're going to go from medicine to surgery and we're going to talk about antimicrobial stewardship in surgery. I'm delighted we have Ke Kelly Blacklock with us and while Kelly uh, unmutes herself and shares her screen, I'll just give you a, a brief CV. Kelly graduated from the University of Edinburgh in 2005 and after 18 months in small animal general practice, completed a rotating internship at the Royal Veterinary College and a three-year ECVD, no ECVS even, approved residency program in the small animal surgery at the University of Bristol. Kelly joined the Animal Health Trust in 2011, was awarded a PhD from the University of Liverpool for studies into the genetics of metastasis in canine cancer. In 2019, Keller returned to the DIC as a senior lecturer in small animal surgery, where she's involved in the clinical service, teaching and research into the genetic basis and functional aspect of canine cancer. As an RCVS European specialist in small animal surgery, she works within the soft tissue surgical service at the DIC and has a particular interest in surgical oncology and infection control. And you'll be delighted to know she and Fergus have recently launched a book entitled Infection Control in Small Animal Clinical Practice. So Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. I will leave the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak this evening as well about this wonderful initiative. And my role today is to deliver a 10 minute presentation just to whet your appetite really about antimicrobial stewardship in surgery, which will hopefully encourage you to visit the, the wonderful platform that's available. Um, it's a topic that I could talk about all day, but I've only got 10 minutes. So it is just a flavor of what is contained on the platform. What I'd like to talk to you about uh, is three main areas really in the next 10 minutes. Antimicrobial stewardship in surgery, why should I really care about that? Uh, does surgery equal antibiotics, equal the need for antibiotics? And what are our, our alternatives to uh, antimicrobial use? Um, it's important to understand ourselves and to understand the multi-resistant bacteria that are becoming increasingly prevalent, as I hope has been evidenced uh, throughout the course of, of the evening so that we can be better prepared for the, the future challenges that await us. So first of all, antimicrobial stewardship in surgery, why should I care? Uh, and Scott has already talked about this, and of course, we all care. We're all here because we care deeply for our patients and for their caregivers, and no one wants to see this situation uh, in any of our post-operative patients. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's very, very difficult. So we want to try and avoid this and we certainly don't want to contribute to it. I wanted to share with you some of the reported surgical site infection rates that are in the literature, depending on uh, which publication that you read uh, and the method of data collection. So for all procedures, um, probably three up to about 8%. We do prospective surgical site surveillance within the University of Edinburgh. Our infection rate for all surgeries sits around um, four to eight percent. And then papers, variable papers have divided up those surgical site infections according to whether they consider the procedure to be clean, clean contaminated, contaminated, and dirty. And I put some of the figures there and the references just to illustrate um, that we're sitting at around up to 8%. And for dirty procedures, 
uh, a little bit higher, which I guess is not a surprise. Patients who develop a surgical site infection have increased morbidity, uh, increased mortality. There's an increased cost associated with the development of an infection. It's really stressful to have a patient who develops a surgical site infection. Every surgeon knows that experience and it's very unpleasant. We've got reputational uh, potential reputational damage as well to, to consider, which adds to, to the stress. And the stress applies not just to the surgeon, of course, but to the whole uh, of the, the practice, uh, the nurses, the animal care assistants, the, the reception staff is felt by everyone uh, around the practice. So we want to try and avoid that if at all possible. And I wanted to share some unpublished data that was produced by one of our now final year students at, at the Dick Vet. Um, and Alexa worked with us over the summer to collect data associated with surgical site infections. So this first table that I wanted to show you in blue, which is the column on the left, is patients who have undergone surgery but had no surgical site infection. This is the bill, uh, the final bill that uh, their caregivers were presented with postoperatively. The central group, the group in red, uh, is a patient who a patient who developed um, antimicrobial sensitive uh, surgical site infections, and the green column are patients who developed antimicrobial resistant surgical site infections. So those patients uh, accrue a larger bill compared with the other two groups. And similarly, as well, with if we look at patients on the left in, in the blue, no surgical site infection. Um, th this is the number of days hospitalized, and we can see in the red patients who develop uh, an antimicrobial sensitive surgical site infection, and patients on the right in green uh, who develop a, an antimicrobial resistant surgical site infections. I've just realized that the green boxes are mislabeled, for which I apologize. Uh, the green ones represent antimicrobial resistant patients. So now we've talked about why should I care? Uh, hopefully you all uh, are, are sort of bought into that. Does surgery equal the need for antimicrobials? Um, and it's important to understand the two different types of antimicrobials that we might be referring to when we're talking about surgery. Um, prophylactic antibiotics are the use of antibiotics in the absence of infection. And the aim is to try and reduce the risk of subsequent infections. And within surgical patients, this typically relates to antibiotics which are provided before the start of surgery to reduce the bacterial burden at the surgical site and to try and decrease the risk of infection developing in the post-op period. And if we compare this to therapeutic antibiotic use, we're talking about uh, antimicrobial use to treat an established bacterial infection. And it's really important to understand why the antibiotic is being used in an individual. Is it preventative or is it for treatment? Because this influences decision making in relation to key components of the antibiotic regime. So talking about antimicrobial prophylaxis in relation to surgery, and we've already seen tonight that we want to avoid the use of antibiotics for clean surgical procedures. That would be things like ovarian hysterectomies or castrations. We really want to be avoiding antimicrobial use for the, those um, patients. In patients where we believe that antimicrobial use is required, then we want to ensure that the choice is tailored um, towards having activity against the bacterial species which are most likely to be present and contaminate the surgical site. We want to choose antibiotics with minimal activity against a non-target bacterial species, and this will limit the impact on selection pressure for the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. And we want a low risk of um, adverse effects or toxicity to the patient. So when we administer our antimicrobial prophylaxis, we're going to administer the first dose within 60 minutes before the first incision. 
this will allow us to achieve the effective concentration of the antibiotic at the surgical site before the bacterial contamination occurs. So for us, we will administer our antimicrobials at anesthetic or just after anesthetic induction. We are going to consider redosing the antibiotics if the duration of the procedure extends beyond two half lives of the agent administered. This is to make sure that there is effective concentrations of the antibiotic at the surgical site for the whole duration of the procedure. And then once we finish the procedure, we are not going to administer any post-operative antibiotics unless there's a specific reason to do so. For example, we've got a major break in a sepsis, which doesn't happen, hopefully, that, that commonly. And then, of course, what are our alternatives? Our antibiotics are only thing that are available to us when we're talking about surgical site infections and, and management of surgical patients. And we've spoken already this evening about marginal gains and never is this more true within a, a surgical patient. So the RCVS Knowledge Platform uh, goes through uh, much of this content, but I just wanted to go through briefly some of the things that you can learn on that platform. Um, hand hygiene is probably the uh, most important thing that we can do to prevent occurrence and, and spread of, of microbes. So we would talk about hand hygiene, appropriate patient preparation using the correct agent, concentration and duration of contact. Theatre retire and etiquette. And it's interesting to investigate what evidence there is for some theatre retire. Some theatre retire, such as gloves, have a lot of evidence. Others, such as hair coverings and, and shoe wear does not. And it's very interesting to read further into that. Good tissue handling, of course, is important because we want to try and minimize tissue damage to maximize the body's defense against microbes that may be contaminating the, the surgical site. So even small improvements like making sure that instruments are handled correctly, uh, sutures are the appropriate size uh, and uh, material for the surgery at hand. Making sure that the team is appropriately briefed and we plan the surgical event and the anesthetic duration to try and reduce unnecessary waiting time. There is an association with increased surgical site infection with increased surgical or anesthetic duration. So if we can work together more seamlessly to reduce the overall surgical and anesthetic time without rushing or creating unnecessary um, risk or error, then that would be brilliant if we can streamline those processes. And then, of course, monitoring. We're talking about um, prospective monitoring, if at all possible, so that we can keep an eye on our overall surgical site infection rate and we can be proactive in our um, response to elevating surgical site infections. And I wanted to share with you our uh, checklist that we use within the hospital. Uh, this is taken from the World Health Organization Safe Surgery campaign, and the link will be put into the chat. Uh, and you can download this surgical safety checklist. It's very, very freely available. You can modify it according to your practice requirements. And it doesn't take long to instigate at all. But I wanted to draw your attention to the two sections which relate to antimicrobial prophylaxis. Uh, the first one at the sign-in, which is the left-hand column. Are antibiotics and induction required? Yes or no? So that will serve as a prompt to make sure the antibiotics are administered before 60 minutes of the first surgical incision. And then the timeout is read just before surgery starts and it confirms that antimicrobial prophylaxis has been provided within the last 60 minutes if it is required. That's quite a common catch. Sometimes we will forget to administer antimicrobials where they are um, required. So this serves as a second prompt to ensure that our dosing is correct and adequate. 
So that's just a really uh, tiny flavor of an enormous topic, which I hope will encourage you to explore the platform further. Um, and I'll, before the questions, I'll leave you with this terrifying quote uh, by Pasteur that is still as true today as it was in Pasteur's time. Thank you, Kelly. A really another excellent practical talk. Thank you very much. Crammed a lot into a very short space of time. So um, we have just a short amount of time for some questions, and we have already had a few questions that have come in that have already been answered. One, a really challenging question around treatment of Brucella canis, which I'm not going to pick up because we do not have time to do justice to such an enormous subject in just 10 minutes. But those of you who are interested, please have a look. Scott's very generously um, replied to that one. There is another one which I would want or do want to pick up, though, which uh, Fergus answered, which is around the use of things like trimethoprim sulfur and the advice from the VMD about use of drugs um, and the use of those drugs and how that refers to them on the cascade. So Fergus, you've already answered that question, but just in case people hadn't picked it up on the chat, would you just briefly outline the VMD's advice around that for us? Certainly. And I think that there are various interpretations of the cascade, and you could argue that if you are looking at antimicrobial selection, antibiotics have different uses, different classes, and actually there is no authorized version of um, potentiated sulfonamides. So you could justifiably, if you feel it's the right antibiotic for your patient, you can use a veterinary special, you can use a human formulation. And the veterinary medicines director are behind us on that one. They are very much in favor of appropriate antimicrobial stewardship. This decision should be made on a case by case basis. And if you feel that, for example, if you're trying to treat prostatitis, if you're trying to treat pyelonephritis and you want an antimicrobial that's going to penetrate those sites effectively, then potentiated sulfonamide is probably as good a choice and you can use that over a fluoroquinolone with the support of the VMD, even if the TMPS is a veterinary special um, and it is produced by BOVA, um, so it is accessible in the UK, as is um, the um, various human formulations. So you should be able to get these products and you should be able to use them. Beware of the same um, adverse effect profile, as has been described, is still listed in the um, BSAVA formulary. But I think for me, they are very, very good first line antimicrobials that have their role to play. And we should reach for them rather than higher tier antibiotics when possible. Thank you, Fergus. I know you've already taken the time and effort to type that, but I just thought it was worth sharing that because that's just such useful advice for everybody. And we've got a couple of questions around um, pyoderma. And uh, Annette, if you're still with us, I'd just like to direct those to you. The first one um, was really around the difference between a deep and a superficial pyoderma. Uh, so how do you define that? And how, during a consultation, can you determine whether it's deep or superficial if an animal has rubbed or scratched and self-excoriated itself. And then the second part of that question while you're answering it is you refer to some guidelines, which guidelines are these? So two for you, Annette, if you will. Hello, yes. yes. So the first one, how to differentiate surface and superficial pyoderma is a great question. It can fill all day though, but it's basically based on clinical signs. So the typical lesions associated with superficial pyoderma are your papules, postules, epidermal colorettes, and then they sometimes leave areas of alopecia. So in a short haired breed that can look like this moth eaten appearance that I showed you on one of the bulldogs sitting down showing us its back with a typical superficial um, pyoderma. Sometimes the differential diagnosis might be ringworm or our owners might think it's ringworm, but we usually say if it looks like ringworm in a dog, it's probably not. Um, because superficial pyoderma is very common. Well, in a deep pyoderma, you've got the infection going on in the dermis where the blood vessels are. So you often find that there is um, there are lesions associated with bleeding, so hemorrhagic crusting or swelling, erythema, and these, er these lesions are often painful rather than itchy. So dogs leave them alone and you might get draining sinuses. So it's basically the clinical signs and the differentiation sometimes between pruritic lesions and painful lesions. 
And then your second question is, I did show you, and I, I, I suspect that the guidelines will go up online. They're all free open access, so they're all available. There is one set of guidelines drawn up by a group of dermatologists by Luke Beckel, published in the veterinary record on all types of pyoderma. Then there is another set of pyoderma guidelines on superficial pyoderma only by Andy Hillier as the first author, but that they were initiated by Iskade, and you've got them all on my slide. And then there is a another set for pyoderma guidelines due to methicillin resistant isolates. And um, the, I'm, I'm currently chairing for Iskade the new set of pyoderma guidelines, which we are sort of in the final stages. They will then be published hopefully before the end of the year or early next year with a set of statements in a short version and a longer version and some infographics as well. So watch this space. I, I'm sure it'll be a great um, helpful document eventually and hopefully we'll advertise it and m maybe even on uh, the um, Sue, can, Sue and team can carve some space on the vet team AMR website as well. Um, it won't be me carving the space, but I'm sure some space will be carved in it. And I think what's really interesting is when we're looking at these new guidelines, the current guidelines are not based on an evidence base at all, are they? A lot of it's sort of folklore and anecdote. Is that, is that not true? Yeah, unfortunately, that's the world of pyoderma. So even though we all use antimicrobials for bacterial skin disease every day, the evidence is actually either quite old before MR staphylococci pop their heads up or they relate to the newer antimicrobials such as the fluoroquinolones and the topical products but actually in between there seems to be a gap where um, everybody was using antimicrobials they're safe they're, they were effective and nobody seemed to sort of have much worry about it so it's either the licensing agencies that required more evidence and that's where publications came out um, and nowadays since MRSP emerged more evidence is coming out but in between there's a gap and Unfortunately, we have to rely on a lot of anecdote, even in the new guidelines now, but it'll be clear which recommendations are based on evidence and which ones are anecdote or consensus. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really useful. So very much watch this space. Now, I can see that we have another question that's come in that says, do you believe we should be doing more in wound management to minimize the use of systemic antimicrobials? And I can also see that Kelly is frantically typing an answer to this. So Kelly, I don't know if you can type an answer and answer it verbally at the same time, but would you be able to just give us your thoughts on that and then perhaps continue to type when you've given us your thoughts? So Kelly. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. I think it's a great um, question. And I think with our open wounds, uh, particularly surgical site infections, we often see them with multi-drug resistant bacteria and we try and avoid use of systemic antimicrobials wherever possible and try and manage these wounds topically. Um, so the first thing we do is address and reduce contamination uh, by anesthetizing the patient, lavaging the wound so that gross contamination is removed uh, and debriding that wound either with a scalpel blade or with debriding dressings such as wet to dry or vacuum assisted closure. If there's any implants and it's appropriate to do so, will remove the implants uh, because the implants will encourage formation of a biofilm, which will allow the bacteria to proliferate in a protected environment that the antimicrobials can't penetrate. Um, we'll take bacterial samples for culture and sensitivity, and then we'll manage that wound as an open wound. And there's uh, loads and loads of options that are available for us, such as vacuum assisted closure. We're a great fan of that. Um, honey, um, uh, Tim uh, likes to use hypochlorous um, uh, sprays and lavages in the wounds. So that's very, very helpful. Um, if you do in practice have a, a wound, a surgical site infection wound that you are worried about, uh, then I would encourage you to take a photo and email it to your local uh, soft tissue specialist. Uh, because we literally love talking about wounds and we'd be delighted to help you make some decisions to try and help get rid of that multi-drug resistant bug without using systemic antimicrobials. Thank you, Kelly. That was great. Um, and you're still typing that answer as well as well while we're, while we're finishing off the presentation, I believe. Yeah. 
Um, so you've still got a few minutes, everybody, to put some more questions into the box. We are going to move on to our final presentation. But as, as we said before, if there's anything that we're not able to answer live, we will answer that in the RCVS uh, newsletter, which we told you about before. So let's go on to our last presentation of the evening. And last but not least, we have Angie Rayner, who's going to give us, it says, a teaser of VET team AMR audit tool and benchmarking. Just to tell you, give you uh, just a flair of Angela's uh, qualifications, if you will. She's a quality improvement advisor for RCVS Knowledge. She is currently director of quality improvement for CVS and has been recognized as an RCVS Knowledge Champion for her role in improving CVS's system for controlled drugs auditing. In 2021, Angela completed an MSc in Patient Safety and Clinical Human Factors at the University of Edinburgh. The programme supports healthcare professionals in using evidence-based tools and techniques to improve the reliability and safety of healthcare systems. So she's hugely qualified to share her knowledge with us now and to give us our little teaser session. So Angie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And it's been a real pleasure to, to listen to everyone speak tonight. So thank you so much. Um, as Sue said, uh, just a, a sneak preview of the audit platform that will be coming to you in the near future. Let's see if I can get my slides to go. There we go. Um, to allow us to enable uh, to undertake clinical audit in companion animal practice. And that means cats, dogs and rabbits really at this point. Um, but clinical audit is really a way uh, for us to find out if the care we're providing is in line with standards and helps us to know what we're doing well and where there could be improvements. And so the aim is to allow quality improvement to take place where it will be most helpful and will improve outcomes for our patients. And so when we think about clinical audit and antimicrobial stewardship, we can use these methods to um, uh, avoid overuse and misuse of antimicrobial of antibiotics, which can lead to AMR. And so we can take um, what we learn from the education platform that Tim has spoken to us about and put those learnings into action. And so that might be discussing with the team what our prescribing approach is to um, clinical problems, but and then seeing how we can then meet that standard that we set for ourselves. And so what we aim to do with this platform is to give access to real meaningful and useful data to support decision making that promotes responsible use of antibiotics. And this data will also provide a benchmark for practices um, that are similar to each other and, and areas for improvement can easily be identified. So we can then take appropriate steps to make the changes um, that we need to make with the ability to measure our progress. And this will be open to all, pra all practices and all vets and will allow us to audit our antibiotic use on individual practice, group, um, if you're part of a larger group, and on a national scale. Overall benchmark measure is the number of, anti of antibiotics prescribed as a percentage of total consultations. And But you as a user will just be presented with the consults that, that have had an antibiotic prescribed so that you can audit them. And so data can be streamed um, through the platform via SAVSnet reporting. So for those practices who already send data to SAVSnet, that will be that could, that's automatic. And SAVSnet is a small animal veterinary surveillance network um, at the University of Liverpool. But for, for those not currently reporting to SAVSnet, you are able to um, send bulk data, which will be uploaded onto the platform. So then there are two avenues that will um, contribute to our learning and improvement. And um, in my experience, giving the team their prescribing data really allows them to reflect on clinical decision making, but also all the factors that influence that decision making. And so when, when we start to build awareness of what those influences are, then the team can start to make improvements that will make prescribing appropriately a lot easier. And so we can also client report, um, capture client reported outcomes, um, but which I'll talk about more about in a minute, but the platform can be used without this feature and we can just use it for clinical audit purposes. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So here is some of the information that can be captured to aid that personal reflection. And so we can record things like what guided our decision to prescribe, um, what guided our antibiotic selection, which can really help us work toward and demonstrate appropriacy of prescribing, which is really vital in helping our profession retain the ability to use antibiotics in the future. 
And the client reported outcomes allows us to bring clients with us um, and include them in the, in the quality improvement process. And so we'll be able to capture information um, about how the animal's doing, but also if the client was able to administer the treatment and complete the course. And if they weren't able to, then, then why not? What got in the way? It'll give us information on patient safety related outcomes as well to help close that loop of understanding of what happens when I do or don't prescribe an antibiotic. So we can use that learning next time when we're faced with a similar situation. And so practices will be able to use the data to examine their antimicrobial use at practice and practice group level, um, but also compare their total antibiotic use and, and also critically important antibiotic use against use by groups of similar practices and put that learning into action by accessing their data to explore the impact of their interventions. So are the changing changes we're making actually leading to the improvements that we expected? And can we demonstrate appropriacy in prescribing? So, and we can use that information provided by clients to better understand the impact of prescribing or not prescribing. So hopefully this all lead, leads to improvements to um, improve stewardship and reduce inappropriate prescribing and, and, and have a positive impact on, on re resistance levels so that we can all, so that we can benefit um, One Health initiatives. So next steps for, for all of us, um, register for the RCS newsletter to be kept, to be kept updated on um, news uh, about the antibiotic platform, uh, when will it be released? So um, the link will be put in the chat for all of us if you haven't signed up already. Go to the education platform and use it and, and talk to your team about it. Um, and encourage people to get involved, talk about why it's important and, and let's start thinking about areas for improvement and then we can utilize the audit platform to help us do that. So before I sign off, I just wanted to say a, a big thank you to, to all of our supporters who have helped to make this happen and continue to contribute um, all of their energy and enthusiasm and a special thanks to the RCS Knowledge Team who um, have um, done a lot of work to bring this project to fruition. Thanks very much. Sue, back to you. Thank you, Angie. And I think that completes a really wonderful evening. Um, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you to David and Fergus and Scott and Tim and Annette and Kelly and finally Angie for your presentations tonight. It's really difficult to pack small amounts of information into a very short period of time. And I think that they all accomplished that exceptionally well. Um, thank you as well to the team at RCVS Knowledge, particularly the ones who've been putting all the information into the chat. Do have a look in the chat before you go, everybody, because there's lots of additional information there, links through. And please do follow the link to VET Team AMR. It's really, really important. Of course, tonight you can put down a CPD and reflect on your CPD. And perhaps that reflection should be to make sure that you use all those fabulous resources that are there for you. They're free to access for absolutely all of us. So do make use of those. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you all again soon. So thank you, everybody. Bye bye.